All right, we are here in your beautiful home, Liam. I think it's fair to say here in Ballina. Thanks, a million, for having me. No have you you've always lived in and around Ballina, haven't you? You've always stayed put in in Mayo. Yeah, I'm a townie. I uh, was born in and bred in, in Ballina town. I lived in a street called Cochrane Terrace. Um, the town was divided regionally for the town leagues when we were kids playing Gaelic football and basketball, and uh, we were from we were from the area called the Pats. And uh, we uh, produced an, an awful lot of good footballers and, and athletes and basketball players and soccer players out, out of that area. And in fact, we went 16, the last Stephen Knights went 16 or 17 years home without winning a county title. And we won in 85. And I think there was 11 or 12 of us from the Pats area, from, the, from, from this one area on the team that won the county title. So we'd be very proud of our street and very pr proud of the fact that we're all Pats men and Obviously, the mixed days were on that team with Porrick Ward, the Gillivarys, uh, all those, all those great players, the Tigers. So we had we had great times growing up. And about I think it was about eighteen, ninety year, nineteen years ago when we got married, uh, we moved out to enemy territory. Now we live in, we live in Knockmore, and obviously Knockmore and but at a, a club level would have been uh, serious rivals over the years. But the funny thing was, and I'm sure it's the same in a, in, a, in a lot of. Uh, counties that we all went to school together we all went to Muradex and Moyne College and we would have played with each other uh, at schools level and pl enjoyed it and had success at that and then we would have played against each other at underage level and senior level um, and it was very strange because Cross Malina and Ballina and not more we all live within a, a seven mile radius of each other and there was one time there in the in the 80s and 90s when we were probably three of the best teams in the in the country, you know, regularly getting to provincial finals and all Ireland finals, so we were very fortunate. We we had the we had the Gaelic football and the basketball going well when, when we were, when we were that age, when we were in our twenties and early thirties, and it was just a, a a great time. What was the the main pull for you to stay? Was it was it sport? Was it basketball and the success you were having with that sport? Well, it wasn't really because uh, the, the the basketball was going very well, and I I played club football, but. Uh, the club football was only sec secondary. The football was only secondary. It was only a pastime, you know, to keep me fit during the summer and stuff like that. Uh, I, I was offered a couple of scholarships. In fact, one guy, a guy, Lord Rest of now came, uh, Eddie Burke was his name, the coach of Drexel University, came to visit me for a week and we had a great time together. And he, he really put pressure on me to sign for a, a good Division One school in Philadelphia. And I was, I was sorely tempted. Um, and, and in fact, when I hurt my ankle before the cup, I think it was in 90, 1990 or was, yeah, 1990, I think it was, uh, he flew me over, all expenses paid, and I went to the college and was there for five days, and they just worked on my ankle for the, for the whole five days and nearly got me back in time to play, but the ligaments were too badly torn. But um, I would have seriously taken up that scholarship or one of those scholarships, but I, around 1918, 19, I started playing for me old John O'Mahony brought me in. And uh, my first full game for me all was an under-21 All-Ireland all final against Cork and Ennis. And I started really getting into it then. And I, I, I liked the higher level and I liked uh, playing with the other guys in the county. And it, that, that was, re believe it or not, people don't know that, but I, that was the reason I decided not to um, go to the States and play ball because the basketball was going great and we were becoming a, a very, very good team. And I was enjoying that. But... All the managers, fortunately for me in those days, were accepting, the football managers were, were accepting of me playing the basketball during the year uh, uh, and then playing football in the summertime. Now, I always made myself available for the league, but I didn't play in much league matches. I would have played 20 minutes here, 30 minutes there. Most managers wouldn't have started me in league matches. Mm -hmm. So for me, it worked out great, but it, it, obviously that can't happen now because I suppose the game is so demanding, so much time you know, spent off the field studying tape on your own and you know all that conditioning work that they have to do that you wouldn't be able to do it now but I was lucky that I could do it then because mm. it's been a big talking point this year Liam that the whole idea that the Mayo players are at home now and they're not traveling over and back back from Dublin so, so when did you notice that, that this was starting to become a thing was it was it actually starting to come up during your playing days the fact that people would start to leave Mayo but still trying to get back to play and all of a sudden you had players dotted around the country yeah it was very difficult we've always experienced that um we had always got we we'd always have eight or nine guys in Dublin, and they would have to train um, during the week, um, uh, two nights a week, and then come down and work with us at, at the weekends. And that's not ideal. It's not too bad if they're in college, but when we had that mature team that we had in in, in eighty nine, they got to the All Ireland final. Most of the guys that were 
living in Dublin, were working in Dublin, they weren't in college, so they weren't getting home at all. Like they weren't getting home for the summer. So we all would, would be without five or six, seven, eight guys for training during the week. And it was always a hindrance. And your point is very well made on that. The Mayo have been very, very good now for a number of years. We've been knocking on the door for a long time. And uh, we've I think we've played in 10 All-Ireland Finals now since since 89. And uh, six or seven of them, eight of them, have been in the last 15, 20 years. And so we, we have been good. But we were supposed to be in transition because we've lost so many players in the last two years. And we've been in the All-Ireland Final last year and when they're all Ireland final this year. And I don't think many people expected that with all the guys that we lost. But I, I would agree with you 100% that the fact that these kids are at home and not in college and have everything is shut down, so all they have time to do is condition themselves and get themselves right to play when they're allowed back to play. And I'd say these guys have, you know, they've eaten, slept, drank Gaelic football and Mayo for the last 18, 19 months. And it's paying dividends now. How happy would you be to see something like that sustainable into the long run? Because like, we've spoken quite a lot about rural depopulation and all that down through the years. You'd have seen it firsthand, maybe even basketball and Ballina is emblematic mm-hmm. of it. The, the good old days are, are, are long in the rear view mirror. How much would you love for a sort of rekindling of a place like Ballina on that sort of level, for example? Well, this remote working, I think, is, is a necessity for, um, for rural towns. You know, you, you, you have a, a town like Ballina, we had a top class basketball team. We don't have any more because everybody goes away to school or go to college or goes away to work. Um, you know, Ballina, Cross Malina, as I mentioned earlier, and, and ourselves were three of the biggest clubs in Connacht, if not in the country. Uh, not more won the county championship last year, which was great to see, but Cross Malina are operating out of Division 2 and we've lost two county semi-finals. So we're not the powers that we used to be because we just don't have the players around during the week. Now, most of them will be students, but they're still not here till till you know April, maybe even May. So you're, 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 you're working out January, February, March, April maybe with, with doing practically no training during the week the guys come home on Friday they're tired you do a light session and you maybe have a league match or a challenge match on, on a Sunday and they go again and that's not enough to um, to sustain and, and, and to develop a, a, a team that's capable of winning a county title and maybe going on like we used to say 15-20 years ago and uh, you see the teams in the Midlands and up around Dublin they've better, they seem to have, for me now they seem to have better facilities and they have their guys at practice you know, Tuesday, Thursday and Saturday. So they're getting double the amount of work done as a group as we would be, say, here in North Mio. So mm-hmm. our Mio, like I think it's the same for every 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 club in the in the county now. So and there's loads of counties in the same sort of position that we're in. So I just hope that um you know the with this pandemic, you know, uh, uh, terrible and all it was that there can be some positives come out of it and that will be allowed people young people will be allowed to work remotely and maybe stay at home and be able to practice at home and and play at the weekends and and make the make the team stronger but simply by their presence yeah because there seems to have been uh, certainly during the, the boom of the last 10 years before covid there, there seemed to be a connection between success in your personal life yeah. education yeah. work whatever it may be and moving to dublin or yeah. something like that whereas it does feel that this could perhaps change that perception a little bit. Yeah, I, I hope so. I hope so. Because we're like, you know, Bellana was a, a vibrant town 20 years ago. It's it's still a beautiful town. It's a great town to live in, but it's not near as busy as it used to be. And, you know, you you um, let uh, you, uh, 100 professional couples move back into the likes of a town like Bellana uh, and maybe have to work in Dublin two days a week would make an awful difference to a town the size of Ballina and maybe try and attract more industry and keep our young people at home if we could mm. and then it'd make an awful lot of difference to the whole community sports wise and economically and and everything it's it's nice for families to have their have their family at home as well but Absolutely. it'd be lovely if that if that could happen it'd be one positive thing that came out of this pandemic like i said earlier there was a boom before covid like i mean the west of ireland certainly felt the crash maybe they didn't even feel the, the boom when it when, when it happened yeah. so i probably I'm speaking a little bit out of turn there. I'm sure that even places like Ballina didn't really reap the full benefits of the years leading up to yeah. 2020. Yeah, yeah, it has been a struggle now, and you you would you would miss the young people around the town, and you go back to Stephen Knight's on a Tuesday night in January to see training, and there's 16 guys on the pitch, and you know you count then how many senior players are there, and there might be six, and you just can't develop a strong um, competitive team that way and I know it's unfortunate that's the way it is at the moment but I hope that can the way it was for the last 18-19 months it can stay that way for the most part and that we, the, the teams like big teams like 
I know I'm a bit biased, but the big teams in the North Mayor area and, and in general can, uh, will have more people back and that they'll be available for, for training and, and, and it, will, it will develop that way again. What is the situation with basketball in Mayo at the moment? It's not near as strong as it, as it was. We, we, uh, we still have a, a club. Uh, it's an underage club. But we go as far as under 16. Uh, we produce some good players. The last good group we had, in fact, was Conor Loftus's group. Conor would be about, what, 27, 28 now, I would say. So it would have been 10 years ago. We had a very good underage group there. They lost an All-Ireland final schools title. But out of the 12 on that roster, nine of them went away to college. So we figured that even though they were very keen to play National League basketball, there was no point in us bringing in two Americans and having maybe three senior players at home with two Americans, five in total and maybe seven away and only coming home tired on a Friday night. So it wasn't sustainable. And, you know, in, 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 in basketball at Super League level, you're, you're, you know, you're going to be spending some money, especially if you have some paid professionals in, in, in your ranks. So it just was something we couldn't do. But maybe down the road, if, if, if this um, system comes into place where people are living in, back in, in their hometowns, maybe we could get back into having a senior team in, uh, in, in the town, which would, which would be absolutely marvellous again, because it really in the wintertime, uh, when there's not a lot going on, you have a National League team that's going well, it's... It's a, it, it really does pass the winter for, for the supporters and the players. Definitely. Is Loftus the only basketballer of note in this squad? Other than, well, obviously, I know Shea played a, a bit as well. Or, or, or are there others that we don't know about? Well, Porik O'Hora. Oh, yeah. Porik would have played with us at underage level. And like I remember I, I was in my 40s, I'd say, at the sta- stage, and he, he was asked to come up and train with us at senior level and I was marking him one night and I was I, I switched after about three minutes I said I, <laughs> this fella's too quick for me he's running all over the place I was exhausted uh, covering him so he, he was always a great athlete his brother Benji played as well um, and um, never thought I'd see him at the level he's at now Gaelic football he didn't play a lot of Gaelic kind of like myself he would have been he would have loved basketball but he's turned himself into a fine athlete he's very very strong mentally very very strong physically and um about five, six years ago, he started playing for the Stephen Knights. I coached him one year with my brother-in-law, a guy called Shane McCann with the Stephen Knights. I was in helping out and he did very well that that year, about six years ago. And he's just kind of um, took off since then. And um, he's a vital member of that Mio team now. And uh, it's great to see it. But he would, he would have been a very good basketball player. And Connor was a really good basketball player, a very good point guard. You know, a very intelligent player. You know, like the way he is in a football field, doesn't make many mistakes, and is a good leader as well. So, they'd be the only two I'd know besides him. Yeah. Would someone like Connor Loftus have conversations with you personally down through the years? I guess because the parallel is there. I guess with his position, with the fact that he's a, a good basketball background as well. Have you had, I guess, much communication with players like him and and this current crop of of young players? And I guess in Loftus's case, kind of mi- middle of the career age players. Yeah, well, it's, it's 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 gone very secretive now. You meet a guy in the street and you ask him about such and such a guy is injured, and he tell you, I just I'm not sure how he is, you know. So you you you'd, you'd meet, I, I I don't see Connor much now. He's in Dublin. Just, I met him a few times. I met him at a game in in Tal in Dublin there recently. His sister was playing, and I had a chat with him afterwards. But it, it wouldn't be much about football and, and, and the guys wouldn't be ringing me uh, asking me for advice I think it's very in-house and, and keep everything to themselves so you wouldn't you wouldn't hear much now you know um, this Mayo team are very very quiet like it's it's it, like it is a kind of a it's a testament to them really how how involved they are together and how tight they are that they nothing really comes out from the camp we, we, we really don't know how Washington Mullen is we don't know how Killian O'Connor is you'll just hear rumours but you'll hear nothing from the players and as regards getting in contact with you you would talk to them but you wouldn't the last thing I'd say the lads want to talk to you about is football or, or sport like like you know how they're going in, sure. in their in their when they're in with the county How big a problem was that before that became the case? Um, uh, it, you, you, there wouldn't be as much video analysis there wouldn't be as much uh, strategy when we when, when we were playing there wouldn't be as much um, it would, I don't think there was ever a, a situation where you'd pick a team and three guys wouldn't be playing I can't ever remember or I couldn't imagine uh, a manager coming up saying we're putting you down as a starter but we're not starting you you know we're starting such and such a guy so it, it was it was very the, ge- the game was very fluid in our time and it was very much we'll get you we'll get you in shape we'll play this brand of football we'll move the ball this way you know, we'll hit the full forward line early. That's what we're doing. 
and there was no real major secrets about it whereas now it's gone very technical and a lot of it is cloak and dagger really you know you can't go you can't even go to a game sometimes you can't get in to see an, an, in, an in-house game you know a scrimmage game between a team now that's just the way it is whereas before when we were playing there could be three or four hundred watching an in-house game so it's totally different now it's way more tactical and you know the way the keepers are playing now and the way the defences are set up you know they're dropping this guy they're dropping that guy this guy is helping on the weak side so it's it's just totally different, but in our time, you could go down the street and you could stand up there and have a coffee with a guy, or sit down and have a coffee with a guy, and you could be talking about the the team and going through everybody, like how everybody is going, you know. But it's different now for sure. You think there's basically just more to protect nowadays? Yeah. There's more secrets to protect. Yeah, well, they're like there's, there's these guys are doing studies or video sessions now, VT sessions for like three hours at a time and. They're, they're getting sent stuff on the phone themselves and they want to know what, what foot this guy kicked with. Is he kicking 80% with his left? He only kicked 60 with his right. They're gone into that sort of, like American football, they're gone into that sort of detail. And um, these guys, the new guys now can't function without that. If you don't give them that sort of detail, they find it very difficult to play. But that's just the way it is. Uh, the likes that I would like to think that if I was marking you, I'd have you figured out. What well, I suppose is kind of from a basketball team, I'd have you figured out after five minutes. I'd know your tendencies anyway. Mm. That I'd figured out myself. That I didn't have to. I wouldn't have to look at you for hours on end on video. You know? <laughs> so it's changed, but that's just the way it is now. Has, has football caught up in that regard then? Because like I mean, that's one of the things they say about players like yourself that you'd better coaching that you were say your your movement was better your defending was better because of, of playing basketball has football caught up in in with regards to those skills that we used to refer to as basketball skills yeah it has yeah and you know a lot of teams would have a basketball coach in mm. just to do like footwork drills them and defensive drills and you know when to help when not to help all that sort of stuff and then when you have the ball in your hands you know uh, uh, you know your head is up early you don't be soloing into into cul-de-sacs which is very important now you see that happening all the time fellas just to get by one guy next thing they get excited next thing there's three tyrone fellas around you you get pummeled and the ball is gone that's not that's not good for anybody especially yourself so it has got better but i see i see loads of guys making defensive errors and i i, I wonder like say oh my god how could you make that mistake when you're watching a game your footwork was all wrong your body position was all wrong you know who's coaching you you know that kind of way so but i think that's just the nature of the beast fellas Guys make mistakes. Why did you go and help there when you and left your man open? But there, there is a lot more coaching going on, and um, there's a lot more coaching going on the defensive side of things. And things have improved the last two years. It was dour enough there, you know, when Pat was on about puke football. It was dour, dour enough there for long enough, and he was right. But there's high scoring games now. Teams are scoring goals again. Teams are looking up now and hitting full forward lines and not being outnumbered like six to two because there's so many fellas back. So the product is, is a bit better now on than it was, say, five or six years ago, for sure. And teams are really going out, are going after it. And, you know, the Dubs did it. In fairness, over the years, Mio have done it. Tyrone are doing it kind of now as well. Kerry have always done it. So, it's and, you know, Donegal are, are playing a, a good... And Armagh yeah. are playing a good brand of football now. And it's lovely. I love to watch Armagh playing as well. And, you know, if Galway can get their act together, they're that type of team as well. But I think it, offensively, teams have got better now. And that uh, negative blanket defence... Uh, isn't working anymore that there has to be a little bit more sophistication than, than, than just getting guys back because these good teams will pick you apart so that that seemed to me at the start of the year like a tactical shift or an approach shift but is there a coaching change as well Liam are, are you noticing the skills of players changing as well as the approach from the manager for example well uh, I, I, I would say Curry and Dublin Donegal would have would have been very good at goal. We would have been good at, good at it as well, even though they haven't got the results they would like. But the, the only way you can stretch a team is with good pace, good spacing, and then good ball movement. And if you can kick the ball from your defence out, it takes those extra defenders out of it. And that, I think that's what you see teams doing. Your cornerbacks, your halfbacks have to be able to kick past the ball now. And that kick pass out the wing is the easiest pass in the game. So I think they're working on when you win the ball, getting width, and then moving the ball at pace and getting it up to that full forward line before mm. the defence is set up. And the good teams are doing that now. And you'll see that a lot on, um, on, on Saturday because both teams now will defend with everything they have. They'll defend with a fair bit of clarity and understanding and then they'll look to break. Because that was kind of one of the things that, that kind of popped to mind when he, when he talked about that, that there is this, I guess, more attacking approach around the country and yet the All-Ireland final this year could be one of the lowest scoring finals in recent years. That's obviously down to the defence. So 
what makes these two defenses so good on Saturday evening? Um, they're both very, very uh, similar. Mm. Both mad aggressive. Both athletic. And both teams are good tacklers. The both forwards are serious tacklers. And is that down to coaching, Liam, or like ca- ca- can you coach that level of tackling, or would those? guys have been identifiable from young age as great tacklers anyway. Yeah, well, I, I, it's, it, it's all about footwork and body positioning. And you would imagine that they, 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 were, they, were, they would have been doing this. And you have to work on it over and over again. Like you do drills without the ball, then you do drills in one-on-one situations, then you do three and threes, and then you, you have to blow the whistle. This it didn't happen in my time because we had to be running all the time and, and working on our fitness. Now you don't do that. Like you're expected as a county player to do that fitness level. And you blow the whistle and say, Owen, what are you doing there? You know, your, your, your body position is all wrong. Why did you come in from that angle? You know, you gotta make, you got to get a low stance. you got to get your body in front of the man. you got to make yourself big. you got to hit him and you got to push him back and push him into the help. The, all that sort of stuff, you would imagine. The top teams are doing it. So you'd, you'd, you'd imagine that's going on. Maybe the lesser teams haven't got that quality of coach. And yet, then when you keep practicing that, Guys will get better. You have to work on their lateral movement, you know, their footwork. You know, you have to work on their on on, on the the technique of it. You know, um, not crossing your legs, not going for not going for mad blocks when you have when you have no help. You know, all that sort of all all that sort of stuff is important. Um, and then you 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 can see like like the Bo guys, the Jeremy O'Connors and Young Dunhu and these fellas are, are, are and Mickey Kinds are all good tacklers. But the big thing for me is. If you're not brave and you're not prepared to let the guy that's coming at you into your chest, mm. you won't be a good tackler. And they're the fellas that, that foul a lot. Because when you're coming at me, I have to present myself in a low stance and I got to try and gobble you up in my chest. Mm. And I got to let you in here. And then I try and push it back, maybe get you onto your weak side, force a touch off you and see, can I get that deflection and put the ball on the ground and then we'll go like dogs and get it off you. But some guys don't like doing that. And you see them putting their hand in at the last minute and then they get caught for the foul. And that's just bravery. It's very difficult to uh, deal with that, but it does happen. I see it happening all the time, that they want to tackle properly, but they're not prepared to take the hit into the chest and, uh, and, and, and stop the defender in his tracks and maybe turn him onto his weak side or whatever. It doesn't happen now. You won't see that happening too much on, on Saturday, but it does happen in, 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 in games, especially at the lower level. Right, so it is all about the arms. It's about keeping the arms away from positioning and not crossing your legs and having a good stance and good strong footwork, good strong core. And you have to be brave. You got to hit. Yeah, you know, if you're the good tackler, hit. You look at Lee Keegan, he'd leather you. And I know he's he had, I think he had two hip operations, and he's Paddy Durkin. They they just love the contact, and they're the good defenders. So they have the technique, but they have the bravery as well. And you do need the bravery. The guys that are fouling, you see their arms coming up. They're protecting themselves, but they're giving away a soft freeze. You've said there that this is one of the most insulated camps Mayo's ever had. So this is carte blanche for you here. What do you expect in terms of any potential curveballs on Saturday? Um, well, we, we, we'd all be hoping that Oshie Mullen would play. Mm. Um, Aidan O'Shea maybe at full forward. Try and go direct. Put that full back line, as we, as we talked about earlier, under pressure. Uh, try and get a nearly score or two. The Dublin are the Tyrones, the Donegals, and the Monaghans. You don't want to go behind against. So if we if we find ourselves in the position we found ourselves against Galway on our Dublin, I think against Tyrone we're in big big trouble. So we can't afford that. So we have to be really aggressive from the start. We can't be going round, you know, lackluster and 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 passive early on. We can't be six points down at half time. That is crucial. So two points down or two points up is fine because Mio have been absolutely outstanding in the second half of those games. So those energy levels and that that um, composure and hunger and will to win is there. But don't come out flat now in the in, in, in the first half because just the certain teams and their northern teams, predominantly the good northern teams, if you get, if you fall behind, they just know how to suck the life out of the game you know, force you into tough shots from outside the high percentage range, turn you, turn the ball over on you and then hitch on the break and keep that five or six point lead that there, there's nobody better than the three teams I mentioned. So maybe Aidan O'Shea full forward, maybe um, he was taken off the last day, maybe do a Peter Canavan out, maybe take him off with 10 minutes to go, ice him down, 
get them back in then in the second half because they got they may, may all have to finish strong as well but we have finished strong in all these all these other big games but um, it's going to be I think it's going to be very very tight uh, I think two very very tough teams both mentally and physically that won't bend a knee for anybody I think it's going to be attritional I'd say guys there could be a, one or two sent off it's going to be very very hard to control your emotions early on especially the physical players the real aggressive players and there's a lot of them on the pitch and uh, our guys need to be very very careful That's like it's very hard to be at fever pitch and really aggressive and not make a mistake a stupid mistake with a high tackle or swing an elbow back because it's going to be I believe it's going to be that type of game it's going to be two teams really um, you know really go banging heads off each other you know uh, on a week like this Liam I know you're obviously involved at, at loan at the moment and that's that's your coaching gig at the moment do you miss the buzz of inter-county on a week like this with all the hype and all the conversation around the county like Mayo no no I don't no I've uh, I've been involved in a long time I played for 12 13 years enjoyed every minute of it I coached obviously Mayo with John and, and George to an all Ireland final it was great with a very young team led by the Mortimers, Trevor and, and, and Andy and, and Alan Dillon and James and Alan, of course, was there and David Heaney. Great, great group of lads, great fun. And I've been with the, 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 with Cav and I've been with Clare. I've been with a lot of teams. And I have to say right now, maybe I'm getting old, you know, maybe I'm just tired. But I have to say now, working with a, a bunch of young fellas now, a real young team from Atlone, is, 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 uh, is a breath of fresh air. It's really nice. And right now, sitting here in front of you, of you and I couldn't see myself rushing back to inter-county football anytime soon, that's for sure. No, there's a big old merry-go-round uh, of, of things happening this summer, as well, or this winter, I should yeah. say, when it comes to vacancies. Um, your prediction then, finally, Liam, for this Saturday? Um, I think it's 50-50. And I think that's all you can ask for in an All-Ireland final. I think if you, if you have a 50-50 chance of winning it, you're in, you're in good shape. And I, I, I would predict that we'd win it if we don't, if we start well. We can't afford to be four or five points down at halftime. So what I'm saying basically is, on. If we're two points up or two points down, at halftime we'd win it. 